Okay, everybody, welcome to Total CEO. I am excited about our guest today. First off, before we get into talking about her, I just wanted to wish all of you a happy afternoon. And I'm excited about today's topic because what do you do to invest in your business? Like, what real things are you doing to move the needle for value in your company? And so, you know, I have uh, a friend, uh, a CEO of a company on, on, on with us today, Melanie, Melanie DeRose. Hi, Melanie. How are you? I'm doing great, Vinny. Thanks for having me here. Great. Well, hey, everybody, I want to do a quick introduction, and I'm going to let her talk about herself a little bit. But Melanie is a lawyer, right? So let's not shut down on her real fast here. So we, her and I are kindred spirits because we're both lawyers, but she left the practice a lot, and she's out uh, in, it's creating some impact with Impact Bars and her company. And so I want to talk about that. I'm excited about some specific topics, but Melanie, before we go too far, could you give us a good, quick soundbite about who you are and who your company is? Yes, but first, Vinny, I'm a recovering lawyer. You have to don't don't get offended, but I always describe myself that way. Um, yeah, I'm the founder of Impact, and E it's E M it's E M that stands for Empowering Women and Girls, and the Pact is helping them to have an impact on their families and communities. So it's a mission-based organization. And, and to me, that's really important. One of the problems that I had with practicing law, and I had a great career practicing law as doing corporate securities, was that I did not feel like I was making a huge impact in the yeah. areas that I wanted to. And simultaneously, I also have, um, I have kids, and I was slugging it out 80 hours a week at a law firm with my husband doing the same thing, and it just wasn't manageable. I, I had no time for myself. That's really challenging. I think women really feel that. Uh, so I set out to, to natural transition from law to launching a health and fitness company for women and launched an in-home DVD product that was marketed to moms. I know it's kind of random. So hold on, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Yeah. You left the practice of law, which by the way, my wife still thinks was the mistress of our marriage. It's hard. I, I, yeah. I'm like, you left the practice of law, let me get it straight, where you worked 80 hours a week to open up a health company that's focused on changing lives for women with impact bars and probably work more than you did as a lawyer. Yes. So, <laughs> but the irony is, I can at least choose the 18 hours a day I'm going to work. All right. right. All right. All right. There's a lot of power in that. But, 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 but I yeah. think also, I think also, I like what you said. It's you're, you feel like you're off, you, you're, this is where you're meant to be to offer value back and really impact lives in your law practice you didn't feel, you didn't at least feel a calling that you were doing that. Is that the big That's difference? Right. Yeah. That's right. And I knew it wasn't the right fit. It just wasn't for me. Great profession, not for, for me. So, you know, we launched this health and fitness company and home DVDs. I am not the instructor. I'm sure all of you, you know, or, or think that's, you know, a lie, but it really wasn't me. I'm just kidding. Uh, and then the bars grew out of that. You know, we, we had an awesome customer base for this DVD program. They wanted nutrition plans. So we partnered with the company and we developed a nutrition plan and then they wanted bars and we really just pivoted to where our customers wanted to go. And we put out kind of a good one of the bar. We threw it out as a side project of, okay, how can we maintain these customers while we're trying to grow a customer base? And it started getting a lot of attention. And then, um, you know, we got hooked up with people in the natural food industry because I, I, my husband and I looked at each other and realized, you know, what we didn't know about food. We were like, we should talk to somebody who's done food before because we don't know anything about food. And uh, you've got hooked up with someone who's behind most of the um, most of the foods you see in the natural food aisle at a, at a grocery store. And he said, you know, I really think you've got something here that's focused on women is missing in the market and there's a void. And for me personally, the irony was that I hated protein bars, couldn't stand them. And I would walk down the grocery store aisle and I'm a, I'm a woman who's somewhat athletic. I would try to be working out, trying to find protein. And you know, if I were a CrossFit man trying to build muscle, I knew what to buy, but there was nothing there that was made for me. And so that's what we tried to do. We tried to fill this void. We focused group women and then we constructed All right, so you a did bar. it. So you launched yes. the bar. You guys are yes. at great success. By the way, they taste great. I brought them home to my family. Uh, I really love them. I, I'm, I'm that husband who's like, oh, my wife's bringing health food home. Like, and well, by the way, for everyone listening and watching, um, the bars are great. 
and we'll we'll have links for everybody but if i wanted like i've listened for a few minutes now and i wanted to go jump on and try the bars where would i go depends on where you are so we've launched in texas at two major retailers HEP and central market and we just launched in colorado at a kroger banner king supers which um for a new company it's is a lot to achieve in the short time that we've launched Kroger was kind of on our list. They don't normally launch a new brand, um, but, but we- What if I wasn't there? Do you have any like e-commerce ability for me to buy yes. bars? That's obviously another huge uh, channel for us. So you can buy them on Amazon. You just search Impact Bars with an E and then impactbars.com, E-M-P-A-C-T-B-A-R-S.com. And we'll give um, a discount code for your listeners for sure. All right, cool. Well, we'll have that here since we're in a live show. We'll have yeah. that all included as part of your packet. So let me go back to a big question. Just in case it was missed, you literally had a high paying corporate job that you yes. left to go do yeah. speculation in one of the most competitive industries on the planet. Yes. Is that correct? Without any, without any history of, in that field at all. Yes, I knew nothing about food. But you know, a lot of it was the personal fulfillment. And the funny mm. thing is, the irony is that I'm someone who can adapt really well. I, I was fine practicing law. It, it was, I, I don't think I realized how much I was missing in terms of that self-fulfillment hmm. until wow. I left. And wow. I realized that I did it in large part because of my kids and also to fill this void. Hmm. But when I got to where I am today, I'm like, life is so different. I love what I'm doing. I'm so passionate about it. To have that passion about what you're doing completely changes the game. And I, I love think it. it can All right, so, then, so then you launch the bars. They're yeah. selling. Of course, the wonderful headache of a bootstrap business is inventory, competition, yes. all this great stuff. I love that you were, had a fitness business and you pivoted so many times. Melanie, I talked to businesses my own here, fully accountable. We had to pivot because we learned what the customer wanted more than what we thought he or she wanted. And so Absolutely. I love that. But one of the things I, I love that you're doing right now, and th this is where I would like to take a little bit of this conversation. So you were telling me, and I want to set the stage right for everyone listening. You were telling me about one of your, you know, in a wonderful bootstrap business where you and your husband are not only the candlestick maker, but you are everything, right? Yeah. Your yes. item that's helping for you in your retail strategy is this live in-store demo. And so yeah. give me a little bit of, uh, of some example as to what that means and how that's working for you guys. Well, sure. So you get into the store, which is obviously a huge challenge. But once you get into the store, I remember everybody you know, coming up to me saying, oh, you're in an HEB. Now the real work begins because you've got to move your product off the shelf. Every category is competitive and you've got this much space and you're trying to appeal to the shoppers you don't have $10 million like these giant companies. So you don't have this huge ad and marketing budget. So what do you do? So we're very hands-on. We're very grassroots. We fly all over the place. And in many cases, you know, one or two times a week, two times a week or so to different cities. And my husband and I, or we other tag team or split up, we'll go into the stores. I mean, we're seriously in there, like putting the hairnet on. I remember a few weeks ago. I need, uh, a, I need a picture of that, especially of your <laughs> husband. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is we're in the stores a few weeks ago and Zeke's got, that's my husband with a hairnet on. And this girl that we went to law school with walks up, you know, she's nice. a partner at a firm and she's like, Zeke and Melanie? <laughs> and we're like, do you want a sample of chocolate cherry bling? I mean, it's humbling. It's super humbling. You know, we're passionate about it. And it makes a difference. We but know you everybody. Know what, I'll tell you right now, she walked out of there as a fellow lawyer. I get it all the time in town. I'll go to a breakfast place and I'll run into a, a wonderfully accomplished attorney in town. And he or she, she walked out of that store guaranteeing going, wow, they broke out of the corporate race and are doing something different. So that feeling where you might've been like, wow, she has this nice, steady, guaranteed yeah. thing. She was like, holy cow, I can't believe they broke out of that steady thing and are doing something really cool. So it's, I bet if I had a chance to interview her, her thought process of that was way different than yours. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. But at yeah. the moment I was like sort of mortified, but also yeah. like, you know what? I'm passionate about being here. <laughs> I'm not here. You know, we can sell the product better than anybody else. And that's yeah, just right. hands on. But, but I, what I liked about it, you were talking to me about not only are you dedicated to getting out in front of the people, but what was the impact that it had on the, the, the retail uh, proprietor yeah. and the owners of the business? 
Right. So you're, you know, you're absent this huge marketing budget. Merchandising is a huge uh, prominent part of whether or not you have success as a new business, where they put you in the store and they have a lot of power. We've come to realize. So oftentimes you, what you'll do is you'll offer the store a discount, like a buy one, get one free. And they will say, okay, we're going to launch you at check stand or near check stand or in a, a prominent place. And when that discount, which runs a week or two is over, we're going to move you out of there. But right. since our butts have been in the stores every week, for one in for example, in Texas, they left us at check stand. They put us there like 50 boxes on top of the salad bar. Nice. They put us all over the place. And the cool part is we've trained everybody in the stores. We took the, we put in the time and the legwork to fly, did a five day road trip training every person in the stores. And now I'll go in the store and I'll check out and I'll buy something. Like I was there buying teriyaki chicken last week. And this person who was selling me the chicken said, Hey, have you ever heard of these impact bars? You know, they're doing amazing things. They work with charities that help empower women. I mean, I think I was in tears. I was like, this is amazing, but it works. I mean, it's, it's a network. You're business. telling yourself, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, right. I'm you telling myself. Oh, you should have let that play. That's great. That's yeah. So, and because of that, you believe that that has helped lead to reorder and that, that, so what I want everyone to understand is don't miss this. Like Melanie, you've invested in your business. You, even though leaving your babies, jumping on a plane, doing live in-store demos, you could go get a model or an agent or somebody go stand there for you. But that investment led to this big reorder, right? Absolutely. Like talk and about that. It is not just having someone there. It is the fact that the founders are there. Because when we go in and I, there's somebody new I haven't met, they say, you're a founder? Like, we can't believe you're in here We're spending yeah. your time demonstrating. And I think that's the best use of our time. I mean, we initially launched in a central market in Texas. We blew sales through the water the first two weeks. In large part, I think because we spent so much time at the store educating the people. We would Every time we go in there, we hand out free bars to all the people running in the check stand. I mean, and it does make a difference. Those personal connections really make a difference. And so, yes, they've continued to reorder. We've had incredible placement. Um, and we're, we're finding that this is also the case at other stores. It's a challenge at each store, and some of them are not going to be as receptive to this type of um, effort that we're putting in. But we think this model works, at least at this particular retailer, so we're going to try it wherever we go. Yeah, and, until you're we're do, and maybe someday you'll be doing it for fun more than obligation, but right now you're, you're finding that sweet spot to help with distribution, right? It, that's true, but but I should say it still is fun for us. I don't like flying and leaving my kids, um, so we try to break it up. But... I, I like doing this. I'm a people person and the bet, you know, our, our main advisor says, this is the time where you really need to just listen, like stop talking and listen to what people say. So being in the store is allowing us to hear customers that say, I really like this. And I, you need to talk about your mission. That's what you should lead with. And all that sort of thing. I'm it hoping makes my wife doesn't listen to this show. Cause she's like, boy, Melanie gave you some great advice today. Maybe you should listen <laughs> and not talk so much. So what do you need to meet your wife? <laughs> Well, if you're going to give her that advice, I might have to keep you a little bit farther away. But, uh, that's good. Hey, so I want to ask you a really uh, a tough question. What, sure. what do you, you think has been the hardest thing that you didn't anticipate? I think there's two. I'll give you two. It's a two-fold question because they're equally hard. Um, and, and let me premise this, but I don't have a marketing background. In fact, the, being a lawyer is like the opposite, right? You completely worry about risk all the time. So, wait, <laughs> sorry, I keep forgetting you're included in that. So one problem is you have this very small widget with this very small good and you have to get out 15,000 messages and you have no idea what's going to resonate and you have this much room. Hmm. So, you know, there's some things on there, gluten-free, um, paleo-friendly. On the back in very small print, we put eat one for a snack, two for a meal replacement. It turns out that's probably our most powerful message to date aside from our mission. Hmm. Um, we keep... Uh, filling our mission, the empower, the women's empowerment piece, but our packaging doesn't reflect that. Right. So I'd say that is one really well, big struggle. Well, is what we do have you mean to by that? Wait, what was the struggle there? So your messaging and language? Yes. Is how do I, what to identify with impact, mm. right? So this whole mission is, is lacking if you're just seeing us for the first time in the grocery store. We're, we, that's a huge part of our business. It, it's not evident on its face, right? So it's knowing how to define your product mm. in a very crowded space. The other one is, is more, the other big challenge, this is more um, relative to just the natural food space. You know, when you develop a natural food product that doesn't have preservatives, um, I mean, so if you, if you make a Twinkie, you know that 
a Twinkie is going to taste the same on day one and day 10,001. You know, you by the way, my food best food friend, his, one of my best friends, his favorite food is the Twinkie. So keep going. This is great. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, just tell him. You, he could keep that in his pantry for years. But <laughs> you open it up, it tastes the same. When you do a natural food product, you don't want all those preservatives thing, or things. I'm not trying to hate on Twinkies, yeah. but, you know, you don't want preservatives in there. You don't know what's going to happen when you produce commercially. And you just have to put it out in the marketplace and see what it does. You can either produce and let it sit on a shelf for seven months before you start selling things, but it's very expensive. It's the most expensive R&D you're ever going to do. Or you just have to do it and put it out there and like hope that you can, you know, lean on your manufacturer who will, has had some background in this and will know what it does. But it, you know, it doesn't necessarily always behave the way you want it to. And think of it this way. Like, what is your favorite food that your wife makes that's a dessert? Ooh, uh, you know, she makes this uh, like chocolate eclair thing. It's like a cake, but it's called chocolate eclair. Okay. Ooh, ooh. Perfect. So when that comes out of the oven, yeah, that's amazing. But think about eating that four months later. Like it's, it maybe doesn't sound four so hours later, I'm a little afraid of it. Forget four months. But... Yes. Yeah. And your, your retailers are going to lean on you to have a long shelf life. And there's, there's gotcha. sort of of the shelf life, which is, you know, when you can stop eating it. And then there's just, when is it oh, going to start? So what's the thing you didn't anticipate there was uh, the need to turn inventory or what was the, what's that lesson that you, that you it, underestimated? It sort of, yeah, absolutely. The constant um, evolution of changing the, it's not even so much the formula. Sometimes it's the mixing process. Mm. Like for example, Zeke, my husband, if he separates the eggs and the egg whites and then he folds them in when he makes eggs, it's like, like super fluffy, right? If you mix them all together in the beginning, they're not as fluffy. So it's it's it goes it's so granular. It's you know, did you add the protein first or last? I mean, it results in a totally different bar. So each production, we have to tweak it a little bit to try to improve whatever we want to improve. Maybe it's texture in one bar, or um, a flavor is not pulling through as much as we want it to in another bar. That process, I did not expect. That has been you know, you you produce something and you're putting thousands or tens of thousands out in the marketplace, and you're like, well. I hope this, I hope this ends up tasting great. This is a lot of money and you just have to keep, that just keeps evolving each time you do another run. And that well, part of it, I think is challenging that. for someone. Like you. It's funny you say that. Cause like literally we launched our, you know, we keep, I keep saying we've launched software, but you know, Rachel's like, no, we've launched technology. We haven't really yeah. launched software. We've built an accounting department and an HR department. And I'm like, we're messing with language and we, keep throwing up all over the marketing stuff and it's not working or this is working and that's not, but surprisingly what you're saying, everyone, you need to hear this in case you're not, you, you need to keep working on your product. If you're not mm -hmm. continuing to work on your product. So we have to continue to develop our technology because someone will tell us, Oh, we like that. We don't like this. We like that. We, don't. we didn't anticipate that at all. Just like you're saying. And so how do you deal with that? How do you, you deal with like this? There's a, thing you know you need to work on versus one out of 15,000 people said something you should work on. How do you balance between knowing what to work on versus over iterating? Yeah, sure. So I would tend to over iterate because just that's, I'm perfectionist. So part of, a big part of it for me has been total shift in mindset, right? Instead of having to come out of the gate, you have to wait till everything's perfect before you launch something and, you know, minimize iterations until after, you know, after it's all done, I have totally changed my mindset and just knowing that most things are going to be a work in progress if, if they're successful. Exactly what you just said. If you're not continuously bettering your product or working on it, it's not going to be, you're not going to be as successful as you could be, especially for me right now, listening to feedback in the marketplace of, yeah, I like this. I don't like this for this reason. I really wish the bar would have this in it. We're still young enough that we can make some serious changes if we needed to based on what the market's telling us. And I think just having that open-mindedness of knowing, you know, this is not just going to be done right out of the gate and it's going to blow up. Like it's going to be continuously, you know, evolving and you've got to be okay with that. So one of the things that bothers me, I'm just going to like throw it out there is I'll, out go there. To, I'll go to events or I'll go to things and I'll hear people ask bright people like you a question. They'll say, so what's it like 
running a business as a woman. And I want to get up and punch him in the face. Cause I'm like, how about it's just tough to run a business. And then the woman thing is secondary. How much do you have to deal with that as being the CEO of a, of a growing business where people are like, how is it being a mom and running a business? Or they ask you different questions than they ask me. How do you work through that? How do you deal with that? You know, I don't mind the questions because I do think it is different. There is a lot more pressure. That there's just more pressure on women as being yep. childcare, you know, spouse. It is just different. I guess what I mean by it, it is different. I mean, it is because my wife is the primary caretaker. What I mean is when, when people ask about business struggles, the same struggles are real for you and I. You just have added layer to it where you are the primary caretaker and the business operator. And God, by the way, your job sounds way harder than mine. And I'm totally respectful. That. That. But, but you know, do you know what I'm asking? <laughs> you know what I'm asking? Yeah. Like, and so how do you deal with that? I dismiss it. So I answered the question I think a male would answer the question, which is, nice. hey, we've got a cash flow problem. And it's the same struggle that you've got or that, well, Benny maybe doesn't have a cash flow problem, but you've got an We all do. Problem, whatever it is. I'm always wanting yeah. to scale things to the moon. So I'm always going to have cash flow problems. That's right. That's right. So I don't think I, I don't think I utilize that or rely on that. Now what I have found, and this is unfortunate, but the, there was, I definitely saw sexism in the legal industry. Like Absolutely. it's just where I was working. It's a good old boys network. I thought that this industry would be different. It is in the sense that there are more women here, but there are definitely times when mm. I'm trying to get something done and I'm not getting a response, I'm not getting a response. And literally I will turn to Zeke and say, can you, can you make this call? And I want you to say the exact same thing I said. And then it's a totally different response. And so I have to chalk that up to the fact that I'm a woman and it sucks, but it's still there. And it, it, I don't let that get me down. It just makes me work harder. I love just it. have more challenge. With some men, it seems to still be a problem. But for the most case, it's not. I mean, for the most case, I think people are super supportive. Um, otherwise with a mission of empowering women, I don't think we would have gotten that far. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I mean, my daughters need to hear this message, right? It's like, yeah. regardless of, you know, I think the point that I'm learning from that, Melanie, is that regardless of the bias I bring to the conversation, I want my daughters to know, fight through it because of what's bigger and right. So you're fighting through that because the value of you leaving your law practice was because you knew you were doing something to help empower women. So my daughters need to hear this message, Melanie. They need to hear yeah, they, th this is where wall you need to be on. And people are going to bring biases. They bring color of skin, women, uh, what zip code you live in. We just had this happen uh, over the holiday with people and family commenting, and I'm going to probably get myself in trouble, but about where certain people lived. And I'm like, what does that have to do with the response to something other than I think there was a dig on someone's economic status. And so bias comes into play, right? And um, so how do you reverse that and make that an advantage? How can we show women that that can be an advantage and use that to, to the advantage of, of continuing progress? Yeah, well, sure. So, I mean, one thing is to, for me, it's important to have the social element, right? So, I mean, when I say that, I mean, it's not that we're just taking a portion of profits, those profits that will appear one day, um, and, do, you know, donating it to a charity. Like, we're on the ground. We work, for example, with a nonprofit in Denver that helps impoverished women uh, transition to full-time work, and they're doing our packaging and shrink wrap, stickering, put the bars in the box for our Amazon orders. So I wake up every morning knowing I'm, in, you know, we're, we're literally empowering women today because this woman is showing up to work, to work on packs. And so to me, that's hugely powerful. Nice. I, I think it's a bit of a gamble. You know, I remember walking into a retail meeting and it's this New York guy and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say who it is, but the first thing he said to me was, I think your mission of empowering women is totally BS. I don't get it. And I don't get why you would make a women's focused product. And luckily I had Zeke with me because I think I turned really red and I was like trying to keep it together. So <laughs> as you were pounding him in the face, you're like, I, I, should, I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, I was just thinking like, are you married or have you ever had any occasion to have a woman in your life? But anyway, you know, Zeke kind of, he could feel it, the, te the tension. So he just, you know, rambled off. And I just left that meeting thinking, I don't want to sell in that retailer. Like he doesn't get it. Yeah. And so I don't 
care that our bars are not like I'm not pursuing this at all because I don't think he can wrap his his you know mind around what we're doing. You so know, I also think you know what I take from that, and this is what I, I'm hoping my daughters watch this particular episode, probably because I'll make them watch it. But you know what I'm <laughs> learning through some of that is those biases actually fuel me, right? Because the lost, yeah. the people who are misguided, lack um, awareness. That's actually why your mission exists in the first place. There'd be no empowerment of women unless we had guys like that. Otherwise, yeah. you, your whole mission wouldn't even need to exist because we wouldn't have this problem. So he actually should have been, in a very perverted sense, a motivation of exactly why you're doing this company. And he was. He was. I mean, I just remember leaving the, me the meeting thinking, man, we're going to blow this company out of the water. And then one day I'm going to look back and think about this discussion and just you know, I mean, there's, I don't hold, you know, I'm not going to burn. Or maybe person. he's the guy that's going to be standing up going, man, I really had it wrong with that girl. Like, that would be yeah. great. Wouldn't it be great? Like, yeah. those are, if we have the humility, that's the story. That's the win, right? And, you know, women, you know, there should be more women, people. That's why I get, like, I'm even getting caught into my own garbage here. There should be more people hearing this message, fight through the bias and go do, yeah. like, what you're being called to do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important. Yeah, and you know, like, it's important in my faith, right? Like if I didn't fight through the bias, how could I literally go share my faith with people? Like, I mean, my goodness, like how could you overcome that? That's exactly right. And I think it is the motivation. And then, you know, on the other hand, I have retailers telling me, oh my gosh, we're, we love that you're, you have this mission because we do things with uh, charities that support women and we've never had a vendor that we could partner in that role and we'd like to bring you on board we'd Love like it. to you know involve you and so for you know for a company trying to break into retail space i think that gives us an advantage that's just not at all why we do it it's just it's the flip side of yeah. the conversation with the man who said i don't get what you're doing i don't get it so well, but we, see, know, that's we exactly where you're taking advantage and I mean, in a good way, you're taking advantage of the facts that you have and you're using that as a way, you know, there are conscious, aware, you know, I saw this great, you might've been there, I don't remember, but I saw John um, from Whole Foods, the CEO speak, and he was talking about awareness and empowerment and, you know, giving uh, the smaller, uh, uh, you know, uh, product creators a bigger chance in a, in a marketplace that's dominated by big food companies. Yes. So that is an advantage to you today. Like more than ever. All right, listen, we're, we're running out of time. So if I want to yeah. find you, we go to impactbars.com. If I want to buy some of your product, go to Amazon. They need some Amazon love. The, the bars are great. I, I can't help myself. I love them. And so, um, There'll be some opportunities here in the links. You can go click on those and find some discount opportunities. What's a way we can support you, Melanie? What, what's the message? What's the last thing you want to get out there to everybody today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'd love for you guys to follow us on social media. It's Impact Bars everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're doing really cool things. And I think the, the more we can educate people about what we're doing, even though we're a small company, um, that's a win for us. And, it, you know, the more people who can get on board and get their minds wrapped around this empowerment, the empowering women message, um, then I think it, it just promotes such a social good that we're very committed to. I'm sure we'd love you to buy the bars on Amazon or our website or in stores. All of the above would be super helpful. Um, and we're planning to roll out sort of um, targeted kind of West Coast, the, the Western United States, you know, for the remainder of this year. So you should be able to find us at more places. But um, I'll tell you, but yeah. you said so many good business nuggets today that I hope <laughs> people didn't miss it. I loved define your product in a crowded space. You know, we all, if you're doing your job right, you have competition. And the largest right. struggle is to define your message. I love that. Folks, if you're not defining the message that gets your product out there in a crowded space, then that's the real fight we all have. And so today, Melanie, thanks for coming on the CEO of Impact Bars and sharing uh, your message of empowerment. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Vinny. We love Appreciate you being here. Thanks.